So, does negative 1 cause a problem? Yes. What is the problem? Zero in the denominator. We can't have a zero in the denominator. So, once it causes a problem, we're going to see if we can factor it out. Can we factor? Yes. Yes. It is the sum of cubes, right? We did difference of cubes, I think, last week, maybe, when we did one of these. Right, so sum of cubes looks like this. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to factor this top one to be x plus 1, x squared minus 1x plus 1 squared. And then I'm going to cancel these guys out, and now my problem is gone. Right? Negative 1 squared is 1 minus a negative 1 is 2 plus 1 is 3. Plug it in. There we go. Last chapter we talked about some reasons that cause you to not have an overall limit, which is what number 2 on your quiz is about. It is talking about um, potentially when you have different things that you're moving towards, Right? And so when that happens, you have some continuity issues and you have some overall limit issues. There's a couple of things that they talk about first is just basically the definition of continuous. So first of all, when you're talking about continuous, they don't necessarily mean over the entire function. So what I mean by that is when they're asking if something is continuous over a certain interval, you are literally looking at just that interval. You're not necessarily looking from negative infinity to positive infinity, okay? So continuity can be more specific than over the entire function. Like a linear function is continuous all the time, right? A line goes on infinitely both directions with no interruptions. That's a continuous function. A quadratic, a parabola, no interruptions in a quadratic, right? But then you can have functions that are discontinuous at certain points, but they're asking only about a section of it. And so then you do have to, to pay attention to that section. Is this continuous over this interval? Well, as long as the discontinuity doesn't occur in that interval, yeah, it's continuous in that interval, right? So they could be asking more specifically. You have types of discontinuity that happen here. The first type is this first picture right here. You basically just don't have anything at that point, right? You're trucking along, you have this hole in the graph, and nowhere on the graph is it defined. That is discontinuous, right? Continuous means I could travel along and stay on it the whole time. We have a discontinuous function here, right? Here, this is what, you know, a piecewise function often looks like, right? We're traveling along here. We stop, and the function does pick up, right, and keep going. So the difference between these two is he is actually not defined there at all, right? But for this one, technically, going from A to B, the function is defined everywhere, isn't it? It's defined all the way here. It's defined at C. Maybe not down here, but it's defined up here, right? And it's defined from C all the way to B. But this is still discontinuous because at C, you have two different definitions, right? It doesn't, it doesn't meet. And so you can clearly see this guy is discontinuous, even though it is defined all the way from A to B. And then you have this type of function right here, where it looks like a continuous function, except we have this little problem. But also, just like this middle guy, this is defined at C but it is not defined here. And so they look at these as in limit, right? So here, this guy would have an overall limit, would it not? So you can have things that, okay, we have an overall limit, but the actual function is not defined here. Here, we do not have an overall limit, but the function does exist right here. The limit just doesn't, right? So one type of discontinuity is the function is not defined there. Here, the limit does not exist there. Here, you have a limit, and the function is defined there, but they don't equal each other, okay? All three of those are discontinuous functions. We have a problem in the function somewhere, all right? So, they've listed it. Definition, continuity at a point. A function is continuous at C if the following three conditions are met. First, the function has to be defined at that point. The limit has to exist at that point, and those two have to equal each other. That means that the function is continuous at that specific point. Now again, it may not be continuous for the entire life of the function, but specifically at that point is continuous if you can define it, if it has a limit there, and if those two equal the same thing, all right? 
at, on an open interval. So let's say not just at a specific point, but on an interval that they give you from A to B or negative infinity to positive infinity, whatever the interval is, it has to meet all of those conditions for every point on that interval to be considered continuous, right? So if they give you a point, is it continuous at this point? It just has to meet those qualifications for the point. If they give you from this span, from A to B, it has to meet those conditions for every single point in between A and B, all right? In order to be called continuous, all right? So they're over-defining something that you can visually see pretty much. All right, so let's look at these. Discuss the continuity of these. So here we have this first function and they have not given us over a specific interval. If they don't give it over a specific interval, and this is at the top of page 69, then you're gonna assume over negative infinity to positive infinity. So if they don't say from A to B, you're just gonna say, is it continuous overall? So first, is the function, the first function here, which is one over X, is that continuous all across all real numbers? Is it continuous? Continuous. So is it continuous across from negative infinity to positive infinity, yes or no? Is there anything that would cause a problem? No. Nothing would cause a problem. Zero. Oh, unless. And so, yes, something does cause a problem, right? What causes a problem? Zero. So is it continuous at zero? No. Can you define this function at zero? Mm -hmm. It is not continuous. It doesn't meet this first qualification. You cannot define that at zero, Right? So that's the first qualification for continuous. Can I define it at every single point? No, I can't. Let's look at this next one right here. This one is x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. Can this be defined at every single point? Yes. It can. Nothing causes a problem here? No, x equals 1. x equals 1 causes a problem, doesn't it? Now, I could factor it out, and I could figure out what was there, but a removable discontinuity causes a hole, right? So over the entire number line, this guy is not continuous. Do you agree? Why? Because it's not defined. We have no definition at f, e, f of 1, right? It's not defined there. Let's look at this guy. Is this one continuous? And so this is a piecewise function. These are a little bit harder to see unless you actually have a picture, but we will talk about it. All right, visually, does it look like it's continuous? Mm -hmm. It does, right? So for a piecewise function, it usually splits it. You'll notice that it split its um, domain at zero, right? Everybody see that? And so when it splits the domain at a specific point, let's say you don't have a picture of it. So if I did not have a picture of it, how would I know? Well, I'm gonna look at the first part, x plus one. Is just that guy continuous, x plus one? That's actually a line, isn't it? Yeah, it's continuous. Is x squared plus 1 continuous? Well, yeah, I don't have a square root or a denominator that causes a problem. That's actually a parabola, right? So those two pieces are continuous. So now I have to figure out if at 0 where it changes, if, they meet, if they're the same thing. Because if they're the same thing, then it just goes straight from the line right into the parabola. And so what I do is I'm going to take this 0 and I'm going to plug it in for each piece. I'm going to say 0 plus 1, 0 squared plus 1. If those equal the same thing, this is gonna be continuous because it's gonna to go to the line and at that point it's gonna turn into a parabola, right? And we have no jump. Sometimes you actually jump in these, that's why they're called jump functions, the piecewise. But these are, this one's not a jump, it's continuous. Let's look at this next one, sine of x. Visually, is it continuous? On the unit circle, is there any time when sine is undefined? Where? Well, you said yes. So we talked about this last year, one-sided limits, all right? So look at this first guy. We have approaches from the right, all right? So there are going to be times when you have this perfectly continuous function from the right, or from your perspective, from the right, okay? And then from the left, it's doing something completely different, right? So overall, you're going to say, hey, there is no overall limit because they're approaching two different things. But there are going to be times when you want to define it a little more specifically. And that's where we get into left and right-handed limits. And it's hard to see right here, so I'm going to make it a little bigger. All right, so we have this approaches from the right. It's going to look like this. You're going to see the little plus sign right there. 
That means from the right-hand side, is it continuous and is it approaching something, okay? And then the same thing's gonna be true of a left-handed limit. It is going to look like that, but with a minus sign, right? A minus sign. And you're gonna see that same limit notation, but then you're gonna see this little minus sign right here. And that means from the left-hand side, okay? So let's look at these pictures. Look at these examples, <clears throat> all right? The first one they give us is a square root function. All right, so let's look at the square root function. We'll just delete him for just a second, all right? It says it wants, as it approaches negative two, from the right, from the right, all right? So we're gonna take it from the right and we're approaching negative two, all right? So everybody see that? Approaching negative two. Now, why do you think it's not gonna be approaching from the left? Is there anything on the left to approach from? No, right? In fact, in this function, it can't be less than negative two, right? Because if it was negative three, we would have a problem under the root. Does everybody see that? So we have this function here, square root of four minus x squared. I have a limitation, don't I? This has to be greater than or equal to zero, correct? So four minus x squared has to be greater than or equal to zero. Everybody agree with that? Subtract your four, divide by negative one, and then take the square root. All right, and remember with this, we have two different things when we do this. This has to be less than or equal to two, right? Or greater than or equal to negative two. Remember when we're doing that? All right, so that's why it's right here. Because if it's any less than negative two, negative three squared is gonna be nine, four minus nine, we have a negative, right? So I can only approach it from the right. What's happening to my y? Where, what's y going towards? Y value. What am I moving towards for the y value? X, I know I'm moving towards two, right? Zero. zero. That's my limit. So my limit is going to be zero. Limit as x approaches negative two from the right is going to be equal to zero. From the left, it doesn't exist because there is no function to come to from the left. So this is an example of where you're going to have a left and right hand limit. All right, look at the next one. All right, look at this guy. He's kind of crazy looking, all right? We're gonna look at him like this. So if you look at this one, this is a step function. <clears throat> you can see why it's called a step function, right? But what's the problem if I wanted a limit right here at, let's say, one? Yeah, it doesn't exist, because from the left, I'm approaching zero, and from the right, I'm approaching one, okay? Does everybody see that? So an overall limit doesn't exist because I have two different things. I'm, it's like two trains that are on two different tracks, right? We're not going the same place. But I can do left and right-handed limits. All right, so from the left-hand side, I can say, well, I can clearly see I'm approaching zero. From the right-hand side, I'm approaching one. But if I were to ask overall limit, like on a quiz, you would say there is no overall limit. But I could ask for individual ones. So I could say, well, the limit as x approaches one from the left, you could give me an answer. The limit as x approaches one from the right, you can give me an answer. And so the left and right hand limits help you say, okay, an overall limit may not exist, but I can kind of get a picture of what the function's doing from the left and from the right. All right? So what about the existence? So these are just theorems to prove, does it exist? Remember I talked about um, this is not a theorem where you're going to actually do anything with it. Like when we talk about function and epsilon delta, it's just saying it exists, right? So this is an existence of a limit. Let f be a function and c and l be real numbers. The limit as x approaches c is l if and only if these two things exist and they're the same thing. So what they're saying is you can have a left-hand limit and you can have a right-hand limit. But in order for the overall limit the limit of f to exist, these two have to be the same thing, okay? So that's what it's saying. You can have a left hand, you can have a right hand, but in order for you to have an overall, those have to be going to the same thing, all right? Continu continuity says not only do your left and right hand limit have to be the same, but then the function itself has to also be the same thing there. 
All right, so that's where continuous comes in. Limit exists if the left and right are the same. The continuous exists if also the function's defined there as well. All right? From the left, all right? So remember, you're traveling along. We already know what x is doing. x is going towards what number? Negative 2. So as we go along to negative 2, what is y moving towards? Positive 2. So from the left, y is moving towards positive 2. So this guy is positive 2. All right, from the right. We're trucking along. What is y moving towards from the right? 2. Positive 2. If the left and the right are moving towards the same number, do you have an overall limit? You do, and it is going to be that number. So you don't even have to worry about that. You've already found him. If these had been different numbers, your answer would be does not exist. Okay? Does everybody see that? It doesn't matter how the function is defined right there. It matters what the limit is. Now, is this a continuous function? No, it's not a continuous function because in order for that to happen, then f of negative 2 would have to equal 2 as well, and it does not. What does f of negative 2 actually equal? What is it defined? It actually equals 3, right? So it's not continuous, but you do have a limit, okay? Does everybody see the difference? I have a left-hand limit, I have a right-hand limit, I have an overall limit because those two equal. This is not continuous, though, because at that actual point, it actually is defined something different. All right, what about this guy? From the right-hand side approaching two, first of all, I'm going to decide if this is continuous at two. Is this continuous at two? Can I just plug two in and be fine? No, why not? We have a problem, yeah. So then I'm gonna say, well, I'm gonna go back to what I would have done to figure out limit, okay? Even though this is just asking for right-hand limit, I'm gonna go back and see, well, then can I remove my problem? Because if I can remove my problem, I'm going to know that the graph looks very much like this. It's going to look like some function with just a hole in it, which means my right and left-hand limit are going to be the same thing, right? So then I'm going to see if I can remove it. The top cannot be factored, right? What about the bottom? X minus, X plus two, X plus two. There you go. This now, what do we do when it's switched like that? Do y'all remember? Take negative. out a negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So take a negative one out of the top. It becomes a positive x and a negative two, right? What can I cancel? Yeah, I'm left with a negative one on top and an x plus two on bottom. Did I get rid of my problem? I did, which means there's going to be a hole. And now whatever this guy is, is what it's approaching from both sides, including the right-hand side, which is what I'm actually looking for. So now I can just plug in my two. What happens when I plug in a two? Negative one fourth. So my right hand limit is negative one fourth. My left hand limit is negative one fourth. And if they had asked for an overall limit, it would also be negative one fourth. Does that make sense? You're tracking along, it's just a hole in the graph. So that's why knowing what type of discontinuity it is, is important. Remembering those that we learned last year, if it's removable, it's a hole. So that's gonna tell you, oh, if it's removable, I'm just gonna have a perfect little graph with a hole in it. So that also tells me that I'm gonna have a limit as well. Because it doesn't matter that there's a hole there, it matters that it's approaching it, all right? So these are just properties, and then they use the variables here, but it's basically saying that if you have a continuous function, so let's say f is a continuous function. If I were to multiply the entire function by a number, it's still continuous, right? So let's say I were to take a number on the outside and distribute it through, it's still continuous. If I were to add two continuous functions, the new function would be continuous. If I were to multiply two continuous functions, the functions would be continuous. If I were to divide two functions, the function would be continuous, except for that little caveat there, denominators can never be zero, right? Um, composite functions. If I were to take two continuous functions and take the composite of them, remember f of g, put one inside the other, 
that new function is also continuous. That's all these are telling you, is that if you figure out that pieces of the function are continuous and they're just adding and subtracting them, you can assume the entire thing is continuous, all right? So let's look at these. Describe the intervals on which these are continuous. So there are times when it can be continuous on certain intervals. Tangent's a very good example of this, all right? Think about tangent. Tangent is my y over my x, right? Right? Everybody remember that? Hopefully. So on the unit circle, using radians, there are times when x is 0, right? What are those times? Think about your unit circle. When is x 0? Y-axis, right? So it starts out at x is 1 over here, right? And then we move up and x is 0. At what point? Mm, yep, but what is this kind of here? What's the, what's the radian? Pi over pi over 2. So we have, we start at 0 and we track along to pi over 2. And at pi over 2, we have a problem, right? Because that gives us a 0 in the denominator. We track along just fine from there until pi, right? Then we get to the bottom piece, 3 pi over 2. We have a problem here. And then from there to 2 pi, we're okay. So if I were to say the intervals, I would say, well, from 0 to pi over 2, we're good to go. From pi over 2 to pi. Do you see what, what I'm doing here? I'm telling them the groups, you better write a 3 there, that it is continuous. Right? We have a break here. Um, and actually, we can go all the way, we can actually take this guy out, because he's continuous all the way here. We can just do this, scooch those together a little bit, right? So, um, because technically he's, he's continuous at pi as well. All right, so I find my problems, and I set up intervals and say, okay, it's continuous for everything except those pretty much is what I'm doing, right? Does that make sense? And so they're asking for specific intervals because technically tangent is not continuous across the board, right? But it is continuous in between here and in between here and in between here. Or continuous, right? theorem. So this is also an existence theorem. We'll actually use this in word problems later on, um, but this is, it's actually intuitive. The way they say it does not sound like it is. This is that f is continuous on the closed, closed interval a, b, and k is any number between f of a and f of b, then there's at least one number c in a, b, such that f of c equals k. Lots of words. What does it mean? All right. They're saying, let's say you have this interval from a to b. All right. So that's the first part. You have an interval. And you have a function on this interval that is continuous. This is the key word here. It is a continuous function. What does that mean? It means on this entire interval from A to B, we do not have any jumps or breaks, okay? If you're on a roller coaster, you're riding it along. There's not a sudden hole in the track, okay? That's all it's saying, that first part. You have a function. It is continuous from this point to this point, okay? So that means if you were to take A and plug it into F, you would get some value, right? So if I were to take X and plug it in, I should get a Y, right? And if I were to take the end point and to plug it in, I should also get a point. So I have a point for A and I have a point for B, right? And it's right here. This is what my Y value is at A. This is what my Y value is at B. Everybody see that? I start here at A. I travel along. Here's B, okay? All they're saying is that if there is a number in between those two y values and this is a continuous function, then there must be some x value that corresponds to it. That only works for continuous functions. Why? Well, because if it was non-continuous, then I could pick that y value where the hole is if it was not continuous. And then there would not be an x that corresponds to it. So this is strictly a, a, an existence theorem. 
If you have a continuous function, then for every y value, you will have a corresponding x value. Not only that, for every y value in that range, your x value will also fall within the range it was given for your x's, okay? That's all it's saying, is that if it's continuous, every y value is gonna to correspond to something within the AB range that it gave you, all right? So how does this work? <clears throat> Use the intermediate value theorem to show that this polynomial function has a zero in the interval zero to one, all right? So first of all, is this a continuous function? x squared minus plus 2x minus 1. Is there any number between negative infinity and positive infinity that causes a problem? More specifically, is there any number between 0 and 1 that causes a problem? Yes. There is? You just told me no. No, there's no. I promise. All right? So from 0 to 1, we don't have any issues. Okay? So the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out what my range is for my y value. All right? So I know my x range. My x is from 0 to 1. What is my y range? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in 0, and I'm going to figure out what that y value is, and I'm going to plug in 1, and I'm going to figure out what that y value is, okay? Everybody agree? So what happens when I plug in a 0? What do I get? Negative 1. Negative 1. What happens when I plug in 1? Negative 2. Just positive. just positive 2. Okay? Everybody see that? So that means if I were to do what they just did up there, um, I go from negative 1 to positive 2, right? when I move from zero to one, all right? So if I am going from negative one to positive two on my y value, they want me to prove that there is a zero. What's a zero? It's where it crosses one axis. Remember what a zero is? It crosses the x-axis, okay? So if I were to take at f of, one is zero, that's this point right here. And f of one is two, that's this point right here. It doesn't matter what happens in between. Don't you see that somewhere I'm gonna cross that x-axis? Yes? All right, so basically this theorem says, okay, my y values go from negative one to two, okay? Prove that this has a zero. We said, is it continuous? Yes, it's continuous, right? Does zero fall in between my y values? Yeah, it does, it does. So my existence theorem says, yep, it has to cross the x-axis. The only way it can't cross the x-axis is if it jumped over it. And I already fixed that problem by, by proving it was continuous, so okay? So it's not asking for what it is, it's saying, does it exist? It has to. This is a continuous function. My y values go from negative one to two and zero is in between it. So it has to cross the x-axis. There's no way it can't unless it jumped over it. It is strictly an existence theorem. Does it exist? Yes, it does. It has to because I have a continuous function that goes from the negative to the positive. In order to get from negative to positive, you have to go through zero. So if it's not...